So Matt, what kind of piece of equipment are we standing in front of today? So the piece of equipment we're standing in front of is our sunflower vertical tillage uh, unit that we use. We run this after majority of our corn stalks. I'd say uh, probably 75% of them. This gets run instead of a disc ripper. Okay. But it doesn't look like it's just a piece of vertical tillage equipment. What's on the back of this? What's on the back of this is a Valmar cedar that we added to this. Um, one of the reasons we got this tool was back in 2014, we demoed uh, the Sunflower, the Salford with wavy blade, and then another Salford. And what we were actually looking at is cover crop emergence and, and growth. The, the one Salford moved too much dirt and buried it too deep. It didn't get as much growth. The other sulfur didn't move enough dirt and we didn't get much cover crop growth that way. Mm -hmm. This one was by far the best cover crop emergence and growth. That's the one we picked. The, the true cover vertical till guys are going to gripe at it because it has a low concave blade that moves a little bit of dirt sideways. It's nothing nearly as aggressive as a disc. It's not a straight blade like a Great Plains, Turbo Tiller, a Krauss Accelerator, or any of those others that have a true straight blades. So it moves a little more. The Valmar Cedar was added. 2018 I bought that. And really what we had been doing for seeding our covers is after our sweet corn we would hire the co-op to spread our cover crop seed, which was fine and dandy except it's an added expense and if you're doing oats or anything like that they needed some carrier so we would have to use a hundred pounds of dap or potash whichever is cheaper to carry our seed and we variable rate apply all of our our nutrients so why am i spending a hundred you know putting a hundred pounds of product on everything just to get my seed and that's messing with my variable rate maps and everything so Bought that, there's all sorts of ways you can mount those things. You can mount them on the frame, you can mount them on you know, a cart or whatever. Uh, so put that on and we've actually used it a lot because 2018 we had all sorts of drown outs that we used it on, probably 200 acres of drown outs after our sweet corn. And now we utilize it uh, to a, mainly seed our cereal, cereal rye after um, our corn. And like now with the, the cereal rye we're growing, we'll use this to, we'll probably run it an inch, inch and a half to basically seed our covers. Sure. Uh, it works at too fine to use after, after bean residue. And from what I've seen with the strip till and no-till, I'd much rather do that than run this. It works what too fine, Matt? The residue or does it break up the soil structure too much? It works the soil too fine and, and it, it actually leaves a very smooth surface. Um, so when we run it in our corn stubble, uh, we have a chopping corn head and then we'll run this about two to two and a half, three inches. Um, and that's it. We don't do a spring pass because this leaves it smooth enough that we can plant the next spring right after this. So. What I do like about this, that it does move a little soil sideways, is, is it mixes that corn residue with uh, you know, a couple inches of soil and it holds that corn residue in place and it doesn't blow all over. It blows more than obviously disc ripped or something like that. I don't think it, the residue blows as much as no-till. Uh, it, it does hold it down a little. It is slightly darker in the spring that I, it does warm up a little faster. And I've noticed where we've done partial fields and then partial fields no-till, the beans usually do get a little bit or a quicker, earlier start after this than versus. But it's, I, I, I guess it's probably somewhere in that 90 to 95% residue is still on the surface. I mean, it does not turn it black. You mentioned a chopping head. Um, will you expand on that a little bit for the listeners, the difference between a standard head and a chopping head? When we harvest corn, the corn head we use has a chopping system that breaks those stalks apart as you're harvesting it. Uh, a standard corn head wouldn't have that. So the way ours works is it has two little blades that run underneath it that as the stalks come through, 
it goes like this and it chops it into smaller pieces. Uh, sometimes I wish we'd, and, and this one's nice because we can turn it on and off. So if we're going to no-till, we like to leave as many, as much stock standing as possible. One, to help the ground get some of that sunlight and, and, and warm up a little faster in the spring. And two, that's just less residue we have to move as we plant into it. Um, now if we're going to run this thing, this uh, having the, the, head, the, the corn stalks chopped is a little nicer in the fact that now they, you can manage that residue better. It's smaller pieces, you have more surface area for that residue, it breaks down faster. And having that chopping head before this helps the flow of the residue through this machine. If we had a bunch of tall stalks, this does a nice job chopping them up, but having them already into smaller pieces works better with this. So it's, it's part of the ma residue management that, that is quite important. So you mentioned um, managing that size of residue. If you're using your chopping head, potentially you're moving less soil with this then because you don't have to go as deep and aggressive to maybe break up that residue because you've already done it yeah. at harvest. Yes, uh, when you mention managing our residue with this, we don't have to go quite as deep with this. Like I said, this thing is only going to run two and a half, maybe three inches at the deepest. Because uh, one, I don't think we need to go any deeper than that. Two, it pulls harder and the tractor we have, that's, that's what it does. <laughs> so. With the cedar part, what I really like about having the cedar on here is, compared to a drill, is we can pull this thing at eight and a half to nine miles an hour. We can run it, you know, actually we seeded a lot of our cereal rye with this. We ran about an inch and a half deep and that's how we seeded our rye. We're actually going to compare yield now when we harvest our rye seeded with this versus seeded with a, a single disc drill and see is there a yield difference and then the question is do I have time to do it in the fall so that's one of the reasons I like this versus a drill maintenance on a drill can get costly this thing we can pull really fast what I like about the Valmar on the cart versus a drill is a mix you know if you run a, a cover crop mix in a drill you get separation with small little round you know, clovers and rape and turnips and light fluffy, it, it separates. And that's bouncing on the ground the whole time. This thing, it rides so nice and cushiony, you don't get separating. I was a little skeptical the first mix I did for a guy uh, that well, I hope it doesn't separate. And we got done and, and I, I checked it a few times to see is it separating because he had oats and stuff in with that. and. It didn't separate at all. So I was really happy with that. We had the, it's an e-gleaner axle and it was a sprayer that we had built. So it was all sitting there. So we, let's make it a cart. So, uh, so innovation is huge. Clearly you're able to take something, recycle it, turn it into something else. Tell us how you're actually getting the seed from there. I mean, is it airflow or how are you pushing that? And then, you know, where is the seed coming out and why? Yep. So the way that the way that these Valmars work, much like any of the older Valmars, or uh, oh, thinking of like Hineker has a box Gandhi like this. Too. Gandhi's. And... Yes, Gandhi was the word I was thinking of. Sure. Uh, there's a meter roll, a meter unit that meters the seed. The seed goes obviously in the big hopper. The wheel there goes down on the other wheel that turns the meter, meters the seed, and that seed falls into. There's a fan on the front falls into an airflow that blows the seed through all the hoses that uh, come up to here. A really pretty simple basic design. Uh, we can talk about the downfalls in a bit, but the hoses come to a deflector uh, that we can look at here. Actually right there on the edge you can kind of see that deflector. So it blows it out, it hits the deflector and it splatters it out sideways. It's a controlled spill. Uh, now we could have mounted those anywhere and with two sets of gangs here. Oh, what's a gang? Tell me what a gang is. So a gang would be the level of discs or the what the discs are mounted to here. This would be a gang that holds all of these discs in together. That's where a sulfurd, a lot of those are different. They have independent, uh, independent uh, well, coulters. They're all independent. 
These are the gangs that hold all of the blades and some machines like a Krauss, you can adjust the angle of this to make it more or less aggressive. This one is fixed. Uh, they, they run a, they call it a saber blade, just a serrated blade that does a nice job of chopping the residue that, uh, and then there's a very slight concavity to these blades that move a little bit of dirt and it does a great job of chopping the residue and then mixing the residue with a little bit of soil to hold it in place. And, and we use it a lot after our corn, uh, our field corn, and then we use it in the fall and then we just plant soybeans into it in the spring. You level the machine front to back. When you get there right now, the back is up, front is down. You level it just like any other, the old discs, uh, so it doesn't ridge and stuff like that. The front set of discs is running at the same depth as the back set. And we, we do mess with that a little bit, where if, if we're using it as a seeder and we don't want to do much tillage, we'll actually run it front up a little bit. So the front is maybe tickling the surface an inch and the back is maybe an inch and a half. And, and that's, or maybe even just three quarters in the front and the back maybe an inch or so, or an inch and a quarter, just to incorporate the seed a little better, but not do a lot of tillage. So all sorts of variability on how you can set it and run it. And, and we mostly use it as a seeding tool. So let's set it to seed, not to tell. Uh, as we go to the back, we can kind of see the deflectors here. And, and we have them mounted just right on the bar here. And it, it, the seed hits and splatters out and there's space this way just for the even number of uh, runs that we have to try to get a fairly even spread of seed. And, and we've been really pleased with how that works. Um, as you can mount them any which way and that's just how, we, how they're done. They just welded the brackets there and mounted them right onto the bar and simple, easy. No maintenance. This one I think is 27 feet. Uh, we pull this with about a 200 horse front wheel assist tractor. My grandfather runs it in the fall, which, you know, you talk about uh, some of the challenges with seeding and cover crops and stuff. That is a challenge. He doesn't want to mess with the seeding part. So if we're putting a cover crop on those acres, we will then hire the co-op to spread the rye just because he doesn't want to mess with the seeding, but he can run this. You know, at 92, he doesn't want to mess with the technology of the strip till and stuff and of the cedar part, but he's an important part of our operation, so we need him to pull this equipment. So uh, that, that's just one way we manage around it. So as we go back to the cedar. Second, tell us about these. Ah, the rolling baskets. Ah, the rolling baskets. So these are the rolling baskets that help break up some of the lumps that we may get uh, and, and get it a little more smooth uh, for a, a good finish uh, after it chops and mixes a little bit of residue. They went with a straight bar that their claim, and I'm not sure it's valid, is it pinches and, and, and presses some of the residue into the soil mix versus a round bar. Uh, others have uh, spike wheels and things that spin around, but that's the, the idea with these straight bar rolling baskets. For our seeding, I actually like them because they do throw a little dirt and it helps mix seed and soil together and get us a little better seed to soil contact. So that's also kind of why we put the diffusers just towards the back. We thought about putting them behind, behind the discs and letting this do all of the mixing, but uh, a lot of that hits right on the discs and, and we like it the way it is and it's less work to change it. So we, we leave it that way. Uh, as we go back here and we, we look more at the Valmar, this is a 6056. I think it holds 60 bushels of something. It depends on what you have, but um, hop, a plastic hopper. There's a meter back here we'll see in a second. And then a fan that's right here that is uh, just blowing air through these tubes and as the seed falls down it gets into the airline it goes through these tubes and uh, ends up in the deflectors kind of have a little quick disconnect here if we want to disconnect it our plan was when we first bought it we were still doing spring tillage with the field cultivators so our plan was to hook it behind that too and since we basically stopped using that 
it pretty much always stays hooked up to this. So after our cereal rye in the next two weeks, we'll use this to seed covers after those couple hundred acres. So a flow meter, it's a meter that, that sits in, in line on the hoses and as the material passes it, it, it has a little pad sensor that uh, it sends a signal to a box that says, hey, there's still stuff flowing through there. If it stops hitting that pad, it gives you a warning that, hey, it's plugged or it's, it's not flowing. So we have had some issues with this with dirty seed. Uh, you know, if it has straw or stems or sticks or something in it, plugging back here in the Venturis, and we can take a look at that. Um, this is the ground drive or the metering system. So there's a hydraulic cylinder, lowers it onto this, and that just turns the meters here. When you get to the end of the field and you want to stop seeding, you just raise the wheel off and it stops metering the seed in. Um, as we come around back, you can kind of see the meters here, and actually we could probably turn those but uh, so the seeds in here there's these slide gates that now it, it flows from there and this uh, great metering roll meters the seed into these venturis and this is the air chamber and as it falls through it gets into that air and it blows it out the front out to our diffusers we ended up mounting it on a we kind of already had this cart we had built a sprayer and uh, took the tank off of that. When this one's ready to go, I will look at something that has an adjustable angle gang to adjust its aggressiveness. If we put the deflectors in the front, we felt that the seed would get buried maybe a little more. So we put them back there. there yeah, the seed is getting spilled kind of right, right here, getting mixed with some soil. And that was the goal is let's mix that seed with the soil so we get better soil to seed contact and we get better cover crop emergence and that's that's why we put them there plus it's less hose so uh, seems simple enough yeah and with everything there's a trade-off in life yeah. pros and cons the downside to this setup is well this tool moves a little more soil than i'd like it sometimes like I mentioned, some of these others that are a straight coulter on their gangs, but you can move those. I like that idea just so you can adjust it. The downfall to the Valmar is you need to have fairly clean seed with the way that that works. And similar to a drill, if you have chunks of straw, it gets down in there and it plugs where the seed comes out. Sure. And you don't know it. Well, I'm sure you could put blockage monitors on there, but... Uh, you don't know it until it doesn't come up and now you got these strips through there so buying a good clean seed source has has proven to be important that you don't have the chunks of straw you don't have you know sticks and things like that in there you know other than that it's worked pretty well we've we've moved around the routing of some of the hoses because well this makes sense and then you use it and well that got pinched and, and whatnot so a ground drive unit like this has for the metering where it meters off of the wheel is very simple a hydraulic drive would be nice sometimes not to not to run the multiple hoses back there um, and you'd have infinite variable rates but you know i was working on a budget and that just fit in the budget so utilizing the the old sprayer cart uh, was important just because we had it and it was bought and paid for. And <laughs> Makes good sense. Yeah. So, you know, for the most part, I really like it. Um, but there's some things that, that I would, you know, when this one needs to leave or is wore out, uh, we may, may look at something different. And this is only a fall piece of equipment. You're not running this in the spring. The reason I like to use this in the fall only is it moves a, a little too much dirt sideways. Typically in our springs here in, in Minnesota, it's usually wet. And you're moving wet soil sideways, and for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, and you're, you're shearing that soil off, moving it sideways, and you're creating a layer of compaction however deep you're running it. And it, and it ends up lumpy. If it had straight coulters, that's maybe a different answer. But with the way that this one moves a little bit soil sideways, it moves it ends up too lumpy because it's usually wet. 
Now we did use it this spring to, we had a couple hundred acres of soybeans that were coming late. We knew they were coming. This is our cedar. So they, they had been, nothing had been done last fall. It was frozen. And we ran this this spring and it was drier this spring and it actually worked out really well. We ran it about an inch and a half to two inches, seeded oats, uh, oats cereal rye mix, cause that's what we had. And um, that, that worked really well for that. And then we just planted into that green. But we knew those soybeans were coming late, like three weeks ago we planted them. So uh, we, we knew we had to have a cover. I would prefer to have our cover seeded in the fall. But that's why I don't like to run it in the spring. It just moves wet soil sideways. Oh, that's great logic. <laughs> so what other equipment do you use as far as in your operation, maybe like the fall? So harvest, you talked about the chopping head. Do you then run this piece of equipment regardless? Or is there another piece of equipment you might run instead in the fall? Say so if you're going to corn. Going example. to corn? Going to corn. So our typical tillage practices after, you know, in the fall, before corn, would be strip till uh, or no-till. So on my farm, 60% of my acres that are soybeans going to corn are going to get strip tilled. 40% are going to get no-tilled. And that's really just kind of keeping those, those fields that have been in the no-till for three, four, five years in that no-till. I think I'll add that. I think I will grow that number. Uh, it may get to 50-50 for next year, but I'll see how the nutrient placement goes with that tool. So most of most of what I do after beans going to corn will be strip tilled. So can we look at a piece of strip till equipment? Absolutely. So Matt, what are we looking at here? <laughs> so what we've got <laughs> here is a really fine uh, piece of uh, strip till equipment. It's a flexicoil twin bin fertilizer cart with their Flexicoil 8100 toolbar and is actually a seeder to begin with. And then it's got uh, 12 Nifty Egg P40 strip till units on it. Okay. Um, I bought it uh, used from a, a farmer in Michigan, went out there to see it and you know it, I, I like the dual bin flexibility to variable rate two fertilizer products at the same time. 12 row matches our, well, we've moved on to 16 row now, but it matched our 12 row planters and our, you know, the rest of our equipment. And the, the biggest thing about it was I had the horsepower to pull it. And actually, I like this one versus a mounted unit for two reasons. One, if I didn't have the horsepower to pull it, we had a four wheel drive tractor that could, where a mounted one, you're stuck to a tractor that has a three point hitch. So you know, that lifts the whole two bar out right on the tractor. Here we can hook it to the tractor and pull it. So it gave me some options in case I didn't have the power. Um, you know, I've made some modifications to it compared to stock, how it came, but uh, for the most part, this is how I bought it. Okay. So you said 12 rows. What can you tell us about that row? What it, go through that row unit with us. So the row unit, as we look at it, the way that the nifty eggs work, and I think most of the strip till shank type machines, we'll get to that. Uh, the way that this one works is in the front, there are two 22 inch row cleaners that move residue. And I don't run them very aggressive. It's a big round 22 inch blade. There's two of them like this. And it moves the residue for where the shank is gonna go. So when that shank does some tillage and it mixes the soil up, there's not residue in it. So it cleans the residue off of the area where I'm going to plant before I make the strip. So it moves the residue, then there's a big 22 or 24 inch coulter in the middle that cuts a slice, it just goes around, cuts a slice in the ground that uh, runs about four inches deep. That helps to cut the ground before the shank comes through. You don't get as much blowing out and as much uh, big chunks. There's a couple gauge wheels that is kind of used to limit the depth of that center coulter. As we work back, we get to the shank 
And this is a three quarter inch piece of steel with a two inch point on the front. Just a straight point, no wings or anything. Uh, that is the tillage part. And I run that about six inches deep. And then we've got our containment blades or berming blades. So as the soil is lifted up from the shank, these blades catch that soil and bring it back to the strip to build that soil up and, and to keep it here. Otherwise, it'd just be another piece of regular tillage tool that it, that shank fractures the soil and it just throws it out and then you'd end up with a hole. Uh, so these blades capture that soil, bring it back and uh, contain it. I can adjust those width wise and forward and back to depending on the conditions to try to get as much of that soil and, and keep it in that strip. And if I pinch them tighter, the strip just grows taller, which with our soils in Minnesota, if I make this, anytime you pull a piece of tillage equipment, you're incorporating air and that will settle. So if I don't build them tall enough, you know, if I have those wide and if I, let's say, leave it level in the fall, come spring, they're going to be settled down. And if I've got a plant there, if there's a depression, water is going to sit there, it's going to be cooler. I'd rather have them higher than the surrounding area. So water sheds and it warms and it's drier. So on the back, uh, the back of the shank is where the fertilizer gets distributed right down. If I'm running at six inches, a lot of that fertilizer is right down at the bottom of where that shank ran at, you know, five to six inches. And uh, then come spring, I'm going to plant right on that strip so my roots are right above all the fertilizer. On the shank, you mentioned specifically a smooth point versus the wings. Why? Why did you choose that type of point once it's in the soil? Well, the reason I, I run a smooth point instead of something with wings is it moves less soil. And uh, I actually don't, th this is what came on here. I'm going to modify all of these to put a less aggressive point on because one, they're two inches wide. I think we get big lumpier strips because we're moving more soil. We're, you know, it's two inches wide, it's pulling up big lumps. And we've noticed that in the springs planting that some of these strips are really lumpy. I'm at a love-hate relationship with lumpy strips because lumpy strips are good for winter yep. because they stop erosion. They, they hold soil in place. It doesn't wash out the strip down a hill and it, and it holds soil there. Come spring, you have lumpy strips and now I have to run my row cleaners lower on the planter to bust up these lumps. Otherwise you get planter moving. So what I'm going to end up doing is cutting these shanks off, bolting on a, an adapter plate, and then I can run different mole knives and I, I can have more aggressive or less aggressive depending on what works on the conditions. So uh, a friend of mine down in uh, south, south, south central Minnesota has the same row units and he did that and it's it's a nice modification. Then he built a coulter system that goes on there too instead of a shank. And your mole knife that you're talking about is really just that little tip down there just it for would information. Be, yep it would be just that instead little. of that two inch shank point mm -hmm. it would be just a little small little knife. You can run a mini mole it's almost like a bullet yep. and just cuts through it doesn't move much soil. You can run one with some wings that lifts and moves a little more soil. So depending on your your environment or your how your soil is you may run it on a dry year you maybe run a little more aggressive on a wet year you maybe run a less aggressive mole knife so he used it some in the spring he liked how that worked typically shank machines are more of a fall only because uh, you get some smearing of your sidewalls or where that shank runs it's usually wet you get some compaction where that shank runs at the bottom and on the side so what um, is sidewall smearing going to do though? I mean, so what? Won't that break down with the freeze thaw over winter? It's a good question. It may. Uh, so the sidewall smearing, I'm more concerned about the bottom than, than on the sides. The last, well, 17 fall, 18 fall, and 19 fall were wet. And I know we had some, some poor strips because it was too wet. And that smearing will create 
spots in the soil where it's, 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 it's dense, that roots aren't going to penetrate through it. So having, you know, this is my seed bed. I want to have the best possible seed bed possible. Having the, the soil in the, the nicest condition without those uh, layers that, that maybe stop roots, uh, that's my goal. So having the flexibility to change, you know, knives or points uh, is important to me to kind of tailor it towards whatever the uh, situations call for. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So you mentioned you're going to show us a flow meter. Yeah. Um, since this is my fall seed, my fall tillage, my spring tillage, and my fertilizing pass, I need to make sure that fertilizer is being distributed evenly and consistently to each row. So as we look up here, much like we talked about on the Valmar, there's a fan on this. There's meter rolls that meter the fertilizer out, and that's controlled by a, a computer in the cab. And as that fertilizer gets into the airstream, it goes to these diffusers. Uh, the diffusers then go out to four different rows. So I have three diffusers, four rows, 12 rows. And coming out of there, we get to, this is a uh, kind of a blockage meter, a, a flow meter. It's not a flow meter, it doesn't measure flow, but a blockage sensor. So if, depending on your fertilizer, sometimes you get lumps and stuff like that. It may get plugged up in here and it stops the flow. If this is not seeing flow, which means this row is not getting fertilizer, it will tell me, alarm me in the cab, and then I have to get out and figure out why. So making sure your fertilizer isn't full of big chunks is important, uh, but having a reliable system to monitor and make sure that this is my fertility for my hopefully really good corn crop, I want to make sure that each row is getting fertilizer. Um, so that's the way that this system works. It has some downfalls uh, versus some of the other systems. The way that this one works versus some others with these diffusers, it's not 100% right out of the meter, right to individual rows, but we have these towers that, that diffuse it. So for the most part, it, it, it comes out really even per row, and I've been pleased with that. But uh, like all fertilizer systems, it's corrosive and there's wear and tear, and at some point I'll have to either get something different or fix. So. And remind us, can you place all of your fertilizer with this, or is this just a portion of it? This is just a portion. That's a great question. So I place my, my phosphorus, my potassium, uh, for sure with this. And depending on the fall and depending on the time of year, I may put some nitrogen in with this as well. Um, you know, our soils, we've talked about our soils and uh, the, the high cation exchange capacity and the ability to hold nitrogen and stuff in this part of the state, putting on some fall nitrogen is sometimes a good practice. So if we have soils below 50%, fields that aren't prone to ponding, maybe not these uh, highly erodible fields, we will put some, some nitrogen on with this as well. Usually our total N, the highest we've gone with this, is 85 pounds total N from the fall. That's including your, we use DAP for our phosphorus, so DAP and, and some urea. Uh, but that's after soil temps are below 50 degrees. And honestly, with the ability to manage nitrogen in season. Um, if, it's, if it's good soil conditions to make strips, I like to just get out and make strips. So if it's warm above 50, I'll just put one, one bin with my, my phosphorus, my DAP, one bin with my potash, and, and leave all the nitrogen out. So I'll vary rate DAP, I'll vary rate potash, and then I'll manage my nitrogen in the spring and summer, um, which, there's some downsides to that too, with with the uh, time constraints and equipment. Um, but we found we can reduce our end rate by splitting those applications up. That it helps offset some of the cost to to get that equipment. So and and we can use less. Yeah. That um, that is something I can manage in season. So most of our most of our all of our DAP and potash 
goes on through this. Some nitrogen, sometimes. It depends. So you mentioned this is a fall unit, mm -hmm. and some farmers are still using a fall unit and doing a spring freshening pass. Have you found a need for that? Are you doing that? And maybe tell everybody what a spring freshening pass is. I have not. I haven't tried it with a spring, for a, a spring freshening pass. Most people that I've talked to that, that run a shank unit in Minnesota, which has been three or four different people, have said, don't spend the time. We haven't, we haven't seen a benefit. Yep. I don't need to do it. And that's the value of talking to other people. So, You mentioned the row cleaners on your planter. Are you using a shark tooth type row cleaner or more the finger? They are, these are a shark tooth. So we, we run two planters, both have shark tooth. One's leading, one's behind. Mm -hmm. One planter has the clean sweep system that moves them up and down. Uh, the other one does not. And after, this was the first year with that system, after running that one, I can see some value to that. For the fact that we plant into strip tilled, we plant into no tilled, we plant into stuff with this, I plant the, the neighbor's conventional till. So four different tillage systems or four different systems that that planter is going to cross, having the flexibility to adjust those, set them higher, set them more aggressive, I think is really valuable. I can, I can raise the pins on the other one. You don't do that very many times and you don't want to do that anymore. So we noticed in our no-till beans, running the row cleaners more aggressive and moving more of that residue helped those soybeans have a more of a darker strip, you know, where we move the residue versus mine where they maybe didn't move as much. Sure. So that was just there alone, it, it's noticeable. And being able to adjust them if we had some lumpier strips for if it was too wet or whatever, I can make them more aggressive, they move the lumps. Where it was drier, maybe on the hills, I can raise them mm -hmm. and I don't need them. So I think the next, yeah, that planter will get one before next year, so. And it's not laying on the ground going down 16 row units pulling a pin. Plowing, yeah. Makes a difference. Uh, yeah. I, I've done that a lot, so yeah. <laughs> so you also mentioned no-till while we were standing here. Um, obviously strip-till, no-till are different. Mm -hmm. You're not using this for your no-till. What are you using to actually plant your no-till? So I plant, I use my planter to plant my no-till, yeah. but for fertilizing my no-till, what, what I use, so the nice thing with this cart, which is, which is what I found somewhat attractive as well, was it has a two-point hitch that I can disconnect this whole bar. And now I have just a separate fertilizer cart. So for my no-till acres, what I'll do is I'll unhook the strip-till bar, and then I built a bar. I took an old cultivator that we had just sitting around, not being used, and I put some single disc openers, some fertilizer openers on that to ban my dry fertilizer where I'm gonna plant my no-till. So utilize the same cart, add a different bar, and I run, run that over my no-till acres and ban my fertilizer with that. In so. the spring or in the fall? The beauty of that is I could do it in either because I, I designed it with the idea of doing it in the spring and I could, but in southwest Minnesota when it's time to plant, I want to be planting. And the tractor that pulls this is usually hooked to a sprayer or a planter. So having the equipment dedicated for this in the fall, I prefer to do it in the fall. I'll put my, my P and my K in on that band and go and do it, it's quick. Pull it about eight and a half miles an hour. Quick, it's done, show up in the spring, plant. And then I'll manage my nitrogen in season. So it, it's, it's a workload balance. It's an equipment balance that utilizing the same tractors, you know, we could, we could run our whole operation on three front wheel assist tractors. One, you know, with two planters, uh, if we didn't have two planters, we'd do it with two tractors, two front wheel assist tractors. Um, one tractor on each planter and one on a sprayer. Yeah. Which isn't a small investment, but no. when you look at the cost of running as many acres as you operate, that's a pretty minimal amount of equipment that you're having to maintain and keep around. Yeah, and there are a whole lot more fuel efficient tractors than a 500 horse four wheel drive. Right. And they're multiple use, so everything we have has more than one job. 
So the tractor that pulls this, is, like I said, is now on the sprayer. That, that's its double duty. The tractor that's on the planter goes to the grain cart. The tractor that pulls, uh, that's on the other planter, hauls loads and sometimes pulls the, the sunflower. So everything is, is set up to be used for multiple different jobs. Well, it really sounds like you've thought everything through, so everything has multi-purpose. The carts have multi-purposes, and even when we were talking about the sunflower, you pull the Valmar off of there, it's got a different use. You really have thought this through, it seems. Yeah, and, we've, and I've actually fertilized some no-till soybeans with this. I just leave it out of the ground. Sure. You know, if it's, you know, soybeans seem to have a response to nutrients placed on the surface where corn doesn't. I, if I have some fertilizer left over, or if I have time, it's more fertilizer left over, I can just buzz out with this. I don't have to put it in the ground, and I'm, I'm essentially banding my fertilizer on the surface every 30 inches, and I can plant right on that. So I have used it before soybeans, mm -hmm. just leave it out of the ground. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if, it's, if I've got fertilizer left over, I have a couple fields where I'm going to use it up, and I didn't have a map, but uh, I just set a rate, and this is what we're doing. And uh, it's a Flexicoil 2340 uh, fertilizer tank. It's got two bins in the, the divisions about here. So it's 40% in the front, 60% in the back. And uh, what's beauty, I don't have the, the meters on there now, but there's two uh, hydraulic meters here that meter the fertilizer into the airflow. So there's a big fan up front blows air into the, the pipes that go underneath there, they're in the shed now, but that, that fertilizer gets metered down, it drops into that airflow and it shoots to the back. Now what controls this is a computer that sits in the cab and I plug in the prescriptions that a, uh, a crop consultant uh, puts together for me and those are based off of my grid tests and kind of what my expected yield is, nutrient removal. Uh, so that's all a map and as we go through the field, based on GPS, it knows where I am, it will change how much each fertilizer needs to get dropped and put on that, that spot. So the technology on that is, is key, that's important. I can, I can set it to just do a straight rate too if I wanted to say put on 100 pounds of potash. I could easily do that, but having it be able to variable rate through the field is an important part for me, and these motors just adjust speed to turn the meters faster or slower as needed. Um, as we go back here, there's a two-point connection here that hooks to this toolbar that holds all of the strip-till units. These are the air tubes where the fertilizer travels, it goes into these uh, connectors that head out to the rows. But uh, what's nice about this is I can unhook this toolbar by pulling a couple pins in here and now I can hook up something different if I want and still utilize the fertilizer metering and distribution system for, for something else. So I, I was kind of uh, excited about that op or that capability when I bought this. Um, so these are the row cleaners we talked about. They're two big 22 inch offsetting blades. Uh, these are spring loaded and they float up and down when they're lubed. Watson, get out of there. They float up and down. I, I can adjust the tension on the spring and it, I run those just barely tickling the surface. They'll move some residue. Here in the front you see the center cutting coulter. That cuts a groove about three to four inches deep and that helps prepare the soil before the shank gets there. On the sides, we've got our gauge wheels. We can raise those up or down, and that dictates how deep the center coulter runs. So if I wanted to run that center coulter maybe five inches deep, I would uh, adjust those gauge wheels so they were a little higher, so that center coulter runs deeper. And what that does is it cuts a slot, it cuts some residue, and then as the shank comes, you don't get as much blowing out. You know, if, if you had bare ground and the shank underneath, it's going to lift it and it's going to fracture. This helps that fracture not be so far out. It just lifts and it kind of folds out. And then as we go around back, we can see as the, the shank 
the point here lifts. I run this about six inches deep, so from the bottom to about here, that lifts the soil. That soil fractures out, and about right here, these blades contain that, and it brings that soil back in to firm my or to build my strip or berm or whatever you want to call it. Uh, some of the modifications that got made on this thing when I got it, these were originally fixed and I wanted them to be able independently float. When they were fixed, there was a, a bracket here, they were fixed. If you got too much residue or trash, it would catch in there and now you're just dragging a pile instead of having these. So this is nice if you're strip tilling after any corn. If you get a corn root ball in there, it may start pushing between the shank and the blade and it can release it. So having these being able to independently float and then these tabs used to stick out to here and that limited how, how close I could put these and how tight I could build that berm. And after the first year I found that they were, they were too wide, not tall enough, so when it settled they were depressed and I wanted them level or slightly raised. So I torched those off so I could move them a little closer and build a taller, narrower berm. To adjust the depth of the shank, I just have a ratchet with an inch and sixteenth socket and you can raise these up or down. When I purchased it, I told them I wanted floating row cleaners. So these parts came in the, in the, the purchase price. Uh, to cut these tabs off and to assemble it, to cut the tabs off, it probably took me, a, and, and to set them all up, seven to eight hours. That time spent is well worth it to get a better strip because that is my seed bed. So I'd want it perfect. You can spend a lot of time changing points on a ripper too. Yeah, and I've done that. And right. I'd much rather do this than uh, be underneath a ripper with an air chisel pounding uh, roll pins and bolts out. So, uh, you know, it, it does require a little more adjustment than, than full width tillage because this, this is my seed bed and I'm doing it in the fall. So making sure it's correct in the fall, it, that's important. You, I think we could always get by with a little bit of, eh, it's not perfect, but it'll be fine. We're gonna make a pass in the spring that'll, that'll help it. Um, if I don't have my fertilizer there, it's not there. And I think there's some real efficiencies gained by having my fertilizer right under my plant. We talk about the fertilizer part, how it comes out of the tank, and those big hoses come to these towers, and then it gets distributed out to each row each row here uh, has a fertilizer tube. In the back, I cut a slot in the back because I wanted to let a little bit of it out to get maybe a little higher up in the strip. So if I'm running that shank at six inches deep and we're at the bottom of the shank there, if I didn't have that slot, it's all right at the bottom. So I thought, well, I want a little bit to spill out, you know, maybe three or four inches deep in that, in that strip. So. So I cut a slot, plus it helps if, if you get a plug at the bottom, it, it can still has somewhere to get out, which I haven't really had any of that, those issues, unless you set it down and something sticks up in there. That's happened before. But uh, that's why we have a blockage sensor that tells me that it's not flowing. But it's, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, but for the most part, it's, it's worked out really, really well. This is a uh, fertilizer bander that I put together with a cultivator toolbar and some John Deere single disc fertilizer openers. I placed my, my fertilizer for my no-till corn about three inches deep with this. When we talk about the no-till fertilizing for, you know, high yielding corn, I, I needed to find a way to get it into the soil. I, I couldn't do it on the surface. I already have a fertilizer cart that has dual product, uh, variable rate capabilities. How do I find a way to, to use that to put soil or fer fertilizer in the soil? So we had a cultivator that was sitting around unused. I t it's a toolbar. I took all of the uh, cultivator shanks and stuff off and I bought these John Deere single disc fertilizer openers that somebody had taken off of their planter. 
they'd use it for two by two for a lot of times putting on 32 percent or or a liquid product um, i wanted it dry this these were a great deal because they had new blades and new shoes on them the the wear parts were were replaced i got a good deal so my plan is and this is the first year i've, I've planted into this is pull this in the fall i i banded my dap and potash they go about three inches deep and then i planted right on top of that so i was getting trying to get that for you know that fertilizer down in the soil where my crop my corn crop would use it so had to make some modifications to the the single disc openers they're designed for liquid product i'm going to be using a dry fertilizer so they're supposed to have a liquid tube that goes on there and uh got some stainless tubing welded some tabs on and now i can band my dry fertilizer right down in that opening instead of liquid and a little bit of welder time and some stainless uh probably about 400 dollars in in equipment with the stainless really that was the expensive part some bending and some welding and now i have a dry boot for my my single disc openers these uh diffusers up here were ones that i had on the strip till cart just took them off and and bought some new ones for that so really for the most part it was fairly inexpensive to set up i probably have what did i spend i spent 150 per row 150 times 12. I had the cultivator bar i spent 400 for these lift assist wheels i didn't need so i probably have got about 2500 dollars into the whole thing and a couple hundred acres of no-till corn if i can get three or four more bushels per acre by having banded fertilizer it'll pay off pretty quick i'm excited to see if it actually yields any better <laughs> i don't know if it will versus what i saw with the no-till yields last year it, it has the flexibility to spring or fall and i think that was the important part